Let me take you on a journey, one that starts in the Sikh Kingdom, then on to England, Canada, the United States, France, and then finally ends in Monaco. Let me tell you about the life of Prince Victor Albert J. Dilip Singh, the grandson of the Lion of Punjab and the Shehzada of Maharaja Dilip Singh. Let me tell you the tragic tale of the lion that lost his roar. Who was this enigmatic figure that left a lasting impression on every continent he travelled? Why was his every move being recorded? What was his rich royal heritage and why was it of the most importance to the British government? Let me tell you about Prince Victor Albert J. Dilip Singh. Now his story actually begins in the 18th century in his ancestral land of the land of the five rivers known as the Punjab. By the, the, the late 18th century, uh, mid 1760s to 1790s, the Punjab was actually ruled by the Sikh chiefs known as Missals or the Missaldars. Each Missaldar had its own regular army. And we have to remember that the 12 missiles in, in total, out of which the Sukrachakya missile in particular, was not the most powerful yet. When its chief Mahan Singh died in 1792, his son, the younger Ranjit Singh, would succeed his father in leading this missile in becoming the most powerful. With the missile dars and with the, the old armies, Ranjit Singh had conquered Lahore, seized vital cities around the Punjab, and now it was to become a, a kingdom within the next 30, 40 years, a very formidable kingdom wedged between Afghanistan and the East India Company that lay on its southern borders. In 1801, he'd been crowned the king of the Punjab. By 1807, 1808, Ranjit Singh had now become the Maharaja of Lahore. His court attracted hundreds of Farangis, soldiers, generals, captains, with over 40 of them actually being given senior posts within his court. R Ranjit Singh, as a leader, was a visionary, but only when his focus was on the now. When we talk about the future, it was somewhat flawed, and the British, they capitalised on this. 27th of June 1839, the day Ranjit Singh died, is when the empire starts to crumble internally. The rivalry between certain courtiers, certain nobles, clinging for power, it all led to the cataclysmic downfall of the Sikh empire. The British empire never targeted the family specifically, it was more for the territory that they ruled. Now the Punjab was beneficial for the empire for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, it was a very rich cultivating farming land and Dalhousie n noted and stated himself that this would be the first kingdom if they conquered it, the minute they set their foot into this land they would be making profit. With Rajit Singh gone and the collapse of the Sikh kingdom unfolding and all of its heirs being assassinated all that was left was a young Maharani Jinder and her infant child, Dilip Singh. So Maharaja Dilip Singh's mother was Jindkor, Maharani Jindkor. Now she was the daughter of Manna Singh Olak, the head kennel keeper of the Lahore fort. So basically he was the man who looked after Maharaja Dilip Singh's royal dogs. Now it's said as a child, Manna Singh would take and carry his daughter on his shoulders and run around the Maharaja and say to Maharaja Ranjit Singh, Oh Maharaja, marry my beautiful young girl because she will make the old Maharaja young again. For many years, Ranjit Singh ignored his comments. But when he saw Jindakor grow up into a beautiful young woman, he married her in 1835. She took the reins after her husband's death and became a serious obstacle for the British. Now, in response, the British started a smear campaign. They wanted to discredit her, so rumours to compromise her character, her moral character, were started. 
Unfortunately, even to this day in Punjabi folklore, her legacy is still tarnished. Here's a young lady, who's barely in her late 20s or early 30s, has taken the responsibility of leading her people. The British now have entered the scene, are now being deployed along the, the volatile frontier along the Sutlej River, which forms the official boundary between Punjab and British India. This then slowly leads to um, a united front for Rani Jinder, where she was rallying the Sikh army in to protect the motherland from invasion. After the first Anglo-Sikh war, the Punjab is effectively controlled by a British resident, Lawrence, who administers the kingdom until Dalip Singh is of age of 16 uh, to run the kingdom himself. Jind Kaur is firstly removed from Lahore and she's imprisoned at Sherkapur Fort in around 1847. And then she's taken out of the Punjab completely to Bonaras, where she manages to escape disguised as her own slave girl. With no matriarchal figure, the young Dilip Singh was left all alone. The only heir to the Sikh kingdom. His destiny was never to materialize because of the conniving antics of the British Empire. Dilip Singh, the young Maharaja, has been deposed by the British. The British are now in the Punjab and the most harshest stringent treaties has been enforced upon him. It's a fantastic detailed, I, I believe it's over 55 pages of documents, articles relating how the, how the British government is going to deal with Dilip Singh. And so, he, Dilip Singh, has to relinquish his empire. And in one of the articles mentioned, he has to surrender the, the Kohinu diamond. He has to maintain a very small army and he has to relinquish most of his territories. A few years later, with the British annexing the Punjab Kingdom, Dilip Singh, the deposed Maharaja, is sent to the United Provinces in India. He was taken to a place called Fatehgarh Park in Uttar Pradesh. And during this, these four years that he was at uh, Fatehgarh Park, he found that his social circle was entirely of Christian, um, Christian people. Uh, his school friends were Christian boys. And he found himself be becoming very attached to the, the Christian faith. In the summer of 1854, the Maharaja left India uh, to head to Southampton. But when the Maharaja arrived in England, he found that this so-called educational trip would never materialise. And in fact, he was not allowed to go back to India. So on arriving in England in May 1854, the Maharaja was given an immediate audience with Queen Victoria at Buckingham Palace. And she took a, an instant liking to him. Um, he became part of the household. He was invited to every royal function, every party of the day. So as per the Treaty of Annexation um, in 1849, the Maharaja was given a pension of 40 to 50,000 pounds per annum, but he never received this. His pension in the early stages was 15,000 pounds, and at best he received 25. And he spent years and years complaining about the increase in his pension. Um, and by the 1880s, he began looking into other ways um, of getting at the government. Um, and part of this was to have a, a book commissioned um, called the annexation of the Punjab and Maharaja Dalip Singh. This Maharaja Dalip Singh and the government, it was for private circulation of about 200 copies. Just to really kind of formalize his plight and what he deserved in, in, in his kind of fair share. So towards the mid 80s, the Maharaja is getting very frustrated. He's getting nowhere with his case and increase in his pension. And he's fearful that after his death, Elberton Hall will be sold by the government and he himself says, I don't want my children to be turned out of their house after I die, just as I was turned out of my home when my father died. The Maharaja is a broken man. In France, he, his health further deteriorates um, and he suffers uh, a stroke of paralysis. In 1893, uh, whilst on his own at the 
um, Grand Hotel in Paris, the Maharaja suffers an epileptic fit um, and is found dead two days later. And such a tragic tale comes to an end. But for the Sikhs, the legacy of, of Ranjit Singh's opulent court continues to this day. The birth of Maharaja Dilip Singh's firstborn, the Shahzada, Victor Albert J. Dilip Singh, marks the beginning of the lion that lost his rule. So the eldest son, Prince Victor Dilip Singh, is born on the 10th of July, 1866, and he's named Victor after or in uh, commemoration of Queen Victoria. Um, she becomes his godmother and he's baptised at Windsor Castle at the, the Royal Chapel. So giving him a real royal status. In order to establish a royal status fit for a king, a suitable education from the finest institutions in England was embarked upon. Established in 1440, Eton College, one of the grandest schools in England, if not the grandest school in England, is where Victor Albert J. Dilip Singh was enrolled in 1881. Two years later, his younger brother Frederick would take uh, admission in 1883. And these two young princes would stay at the school and go through a, an education fit for royalty and fit for the aristocratic families of England. But let's not forget, Victor was the first of his kind here, first of Sikh origin, the first Indian student to actually come to Eton College. Let's think about how difficult that possibly could have been for this young man. But even through his years at Eton, many a good friend was made here. Lord Carnarvon, Lord Coventry, Friendships which would last and continue through to Cambridge, through to Sandhurst, and then through for the rest of his life. Behind me is a plaque which commemorates the two princes um, by one of Victor's sisters. And the plaque in Latin tells us of the two students being part of Eton College and the years that they would have actually enrolled. So in 1885, graduating Eton College with his good friends, the princes, the earls, the lords, they all head to Cambridge University for further education. And at Cambridge, they all joined Trinity College, a college that was founded in 1546 by none other than Henry VIII. Now, it was at this college that Victor would go on to meet his future wife, his good friend, the Earl of Coventry's sister, Lady Anne. But that three-year stint of education was cut short because Maharaja Dilip Singh wanted to find a wife for Victor and he wanted him and the rest of the family to go back to India to find that wife. The wife was to be from a Sikh family, from one of the Sardars families, one of the noblemen, one of the clan leader families. The Royal Military Academy at Sandhurst. This was established in 1812. In 1887, at the age of 21, His Royal Highness Victor Albert J. de Leipzig would join the academy, but only through a special letter of dispensation provided by his godmother, Queen Victoria, making Victor the first of Sikh origin, the first actually of Indian origin, to join the academy. Victor goes on and spends two terms here at the Academy, graduating in December of 1888, at which point he joins the 1st Dragoons as a lieutenant. As a member of the 1st Dragoons, the landscape for Prince Victor was about to change from the United Kingdom to Canada, when Victor was requested to become the aide-de-camp to General Sir John Ross, who was stationed at the British North American Military Headquarters in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Less than 25 years after Canada's Confederation, signalling the birth of a nation, on September the 18th, 1888, Victor leaves Liverpool Harbour 
on the steamship Caspian. It sets sail for Halifax, Nova Scotia. He arrives on September the 30th after a 12 day journey. The grandson of the Lion of Punjab, Prince Victor Albert J. Dilip Singh becomes the first of Sikh origin to live in Canada. The most important thing about Halifax at the time was it was both the centre for the uh, British Navy in North America and it was the centre for the British Army in North America. So what was daily life like in Halifax, Nova Scotia for Prince Victor? Where did he reside and what did he do as aide-de-camp to General Sir John Ross? The property he rented was, uh, was not a particularly old house. The three houses that were all identical uh, were on the corner of Hastings and Spring Garden Road. Um, Henry Peters was the, uh, the contractor and builder of the houses. He may also have been the architect. Um, and they were built, uh, they were built in 1879-1880, so by the time he arrived they were not particularly old structures. He was actually what was called a supernumerary aide-de-camp, which meant that he actually didn't, as Queen Victoria's godson, do anything if he didn't want to. The prince attended all those things when Sir John Ross went to a ball, when Sir John Ross um, uh, went to dinners. He would probably have attended all of those with him. Also because of his polo, he was probably playing polo from time to time, either at the polo grounds off of Quimple Road or up at the polo grounds at Fort Needham. I think he liked enjoying all the best parts of being in the army without necessarily the, the worst parts. Even though he was the godson of Queen Victoria, the vilification of his character continued in the press by the American tabloids. It appears that um, probably Victor left, I mean, the, the date of the documents is the 11th of February, 1890. So, and they indicate that the prince is no longer here and uh, Mr. William T. was a caterer in, in today's terms, um, put in a, a bill that, that the prince owed him $40. And this all goes through the court and you discover that when they do evaluation of the prince's uh, worldly goods in Halifax uh, when he left, it adds up to almost $752 in some sense. So almost uh, 10, 20 times the $40. So where the stories in the American newspapers that he, you know, f f stole away in the dead of night to, to get away from all these creditors who he owed money to is very hard to understand based on what we know in Halifax. The British government were not, were always trying to find ways of giving the um, Singh family bad press if indeed they simply put a little pressure on the uh, on the American press and the American press who agreed to always show him in the worst light. You know, they did this earlier when they claimed that he was uh, perhaps going to marry uh, the daughter of a wealthy New York uh, banker. This financial legacy was not always true or accurate, but it begins to haunt and catch up to Prince Victor. You're forced to remain in a circle of peers and members of Europe's upper crust families. Born into aristocratic homes, and like yourself, they're lords, they're earls, and they're princes of the British realm. You are a Maharaja in exile. The extent of your rightful domain is far greater than even theirs. Your social circle enjoys the best luxuries that money can buy. Yet you, your wealth is capped at 8,500 pounds a year. It doesn't take a genius or a great mathematician to understand that bankruptcy notices become Victor's calling card. So in 1890, he returns from Canada as a captain in the First Dragoons. His high-ranking friends such as Lord Carnarvon, um, the Rothschilds, um, the Earl Durhurst, um, who was his friend from his days in Cambridge. Um, Lord Carnarvon, he, he, tra he travels with him to, to France, uh, to Monte Carlo, um, and even, even Cairo, where Carnarvon discovers the, the tomb of Tutankhamun. In 1898, he marries 
the, the sister of his best friend, Lord Deerhurst, Lady Anne Alice of Coventry. The marriage is one of the high society weddings of its day, um, done in a very trendy part of London, um, with all the nobility um, and all the lords and earls of the day attending this grand wedding. Soon after the wedding, Queen Victoria calls upon Lady Anne to Buckingham Palace, and she asks from a promise from her. She basically tells Lady Anne that she must promise her that she never gives Prince Victor a child. And secondly, she requests her to take the prince away from the United Kingdom, take, take him anywhere in Europe. So in 1902, at the age of 36, His Royal Highness Prince Victor Albert J. Dilip Singh faces his own exile. By the request of Queen Victoria, they're asked to leave England. Why? Because debts were accumulating. Debts were up to £118,000 now. But was that all his own fault? I fear not. It was a lack of funds that were being provided to him by the India office. So let me paint a picture of Europe at the time of Victor's residence here in Paris. This was a place of opulence and extravagance. The society people were going to balls. And if you could, you would go to the costume balls. Opera houses were being frequented. None other than Pablo Picasso was going through his blue period here in Paris. These would have been some of the surroundings. It made a lot of sense for Victor to have chosen Paris as the city outside of London. But these apartment buildings were no Elverdon Hall. These apartment buildings were no Hockwood Hall. They were quite humbling. But maybe that's what they were looking for. A token Indian prince with no wealth and no control over his own destiny. A person whose wealth, whose father's wealth, whose grandfather's wealth was one of the richest kingdoms in the world had all been taken and a petty pension was being provided. Yet the family line of Maharaja Ranjit Singh, the line of Punjab, ended abruptly with his grandchildren in the UK. Was this just simple coincidence or was this strategic? Was this just because their children had no offspring or was it because this was a government plan to end any claims to the Sikh Kingdom and the Punjab. On the 7th of June, 1918, His Royal Highness Prince Victor Albert J. Dilip Singh passes away at a young age of 51. He leaves this world with just his wife by his side. The grandson of the line of Punjab, the son of Maharaja Dilip Singh is no more. The heir to the throne is no more. The coverage in the media was talking about the death of Prince Victor. But throughout his life, the coverage was always about his financial situations, something that was strategically planned by the India office. Queen Victoria, her godson, is no more. Thank <laughs> you.